Well, good morning, Access Church. How many of you are thankful to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen. And if you'll stand to your feet with us, I just want to turn to the Word of God for a minute, get our eyes focused on the Lord. Psalm 92 says this, It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name. It is good to praise the Lord and make music to your name, O Most High God, to proclaim your love in the morning and your faithfulness at night, to the music of the ten-string lyre and the melody of the harp. For you make me glad by your deeds, O Lord. I sing for joy at the works of your hand. And then this is what it says later on in that same chapter. It says this, The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. They will grow like a cedar of Lebanon. Planted in the house of the Lord, that's where you're planted this morning, they will flourish in the courts of our God. So as we just fix our eyes on Jesus today and say, Father, we thank you for your presence that's with us right now. Holy Spirit, would you just come and invade this space? Holy Spirit, would you come and lead this service? We turn our eyes to you. It says in your word, Lord, that it is good to make music to you. It is good to sing praises to your name, O Most High God. So, Lord, we use our voice today to raise it to you. For you are, you are wonderful. You are glorious, Father. We love you. We thank you, Father, for what you've got in store for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Sing with us this morning. Let's make some music with our voices.
Worship today. Glenn's going to share just a word of exhortation. Sometimes the Lord will just speak to someone just to affirm and remind us of the importance that we're doing, of what we're doing in this moment. And so he's going to just share uh, with you. You're good. All right. Yeah. Um, while we're worshiping, like in the spirit, like I heard war drums from the heavens. And the Lord.
Lord just quickly put this in my heart. He said, the war drums are beating in the heavens, sounding the call to assemble my warriors. A sound to war has been sounded. My people call from the earth today, calling for the battles to begin. Your song of praise rises to me today, and I'm enjoying the sound of your praises. I'm ready to move. Are you ready to receive your victory? Amen. Amen. Are you ready to receive your victory? You know, as we sing, it's more than just a transition from the beginning of the service to speaking, but God is accomplishing things even as we praise and even as we worship, right? The Bible says we don't fight what? Flesh and blood, but there are spiritual things that we fight. And how foolish that our words carry the power even in our praise and our worship to accomplish amazing things. Amen. You believe that? And so why don't you just lift up your voice and I want you to sing this song. I want you to sing it like you mean it. Maybe you're awake now and now you're ready to sing. Maybe you don't have a good voice, but you know what? Yeah, that's all right. Join the club, right? Let's sing it. I'm going to sing. I'm going to sing in the middle of a song.
Yes. Praise the Lord, Access Church. Praise the Lord, Access Church. Come on, you can get louder than that. Praise the Lord, Access Church. Let's praise the Lord, the one that freed us, the one that healed us, the one that delivered us, the one that was with you in the night, in the coldest of nights and darkest of nights, the one that was with you that never left you. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, we sang earlier that we were going to sing louder and louder. I can promise you that's not because God is hard of hearing, right? He's not sitting up in heaven with his hearing aid cranked up, right, trying to hear us. When we say louder and louder, because we're declaring that we're going to sing louder than the circumstances, the things, the storms that are going on in our lives, that no matter what's going on, that we are going to praise the Lord. If you know the history of that song, it was actually written very during a very difficult time. Uh, the CEO of the record label, his son was told that he wouldn't live through the night. They were told that his son wouldn't live through the night. So the team got together and they just began to sing and they began to worship. And that's the song that came out of that time. An amazing, amazing, amazing testimony. Right? God has this incredible ability of being able to give beauty where there's ashes, right? And so I want to ask you a question this morning. What do you need to exchange? What are the ashes that you need to exchange this morning that God is going to return, give beauty? When you think about ashes, right, it's a lifeless situation. It's a hopeless situation. It feels like a helpless situation, a desperate situation. God has such a great way of taking those times and turning them into something incredible and beautiful. So as I pray this morning, if if you are in that situation, right, think of that in your mind. And I want you to picture exchanging that with the Lord and him taking that situation and turning it into something beautiful something amazing, an incredible testimony. And if that's not you, maybe you know someone that's in that situation. You can be praying for them. God, we thank you that you do have an incredible way of taking our ashes and taking our brokenness and the things that are messed up in our lives and making something beautiful out of them. We thank you, Lord. God, I pray for every individual that is in that situation, Lord God, that you would strengthen them, that you would encourage them, Lord God, that you would fill them with hope. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. We praise your name. You are holy and mighty and awesome. We thank you that we can come to you and that we can hand you ashes and you in return give us something beautiful, Lord. That we can give you our sin and you make us whole and you make us right. We thank you, Lord. Oh, we praise you this morning again. One more time, church. Praise the Lord with everything inside of you. Thank you, Lord. You are holy and mighty and awesome and worthy in every way, Lord. We thank you, God. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Why don't you go ahead and greet one another before we go ahead and sit down. We've got a couple quick announcements. Well, good morning, everybody. It is great to, to see you. I want to welcome all of those that are tuning in from Center County Correctional Facility. It is great to have you. All those that are tuning in online, it is great to, to see you. If you are new here this morning, please make your way out to the new here table in the back. We'll collect some information. It just allows us to provide you more information regarding Access Church and everything that uh, we are doing. As a quick reminder... You want to make sure uh, to check out our digital program. You can do that on your phone. You can do that uh, from your computer. Again, just go to program.seaccesschurch.com. You'll be able to find out uh, everything that's going on in the, the church there. Uh, a couple quick announcements. Uh, we are having our pool party tonight. 
Uh, it's going to be from 5 to 7. The weather is a little iffy, so we are going to make an announcement by 3 o'clock. But as of right now, it is on. You can go to our Facebook page, check it out uh, to see if we are still hosting it. But as of right now, it is still on. Uh, just prepare to bring you know, an easy side. It will make things easier for you and your family. It's going to be tonight, 5 to 7. We're going to swim, play games, just connect. It's going to be uh, an awesome time. Now, uh, before uh, we've got our next announcement, we want to share a quick video here on the kids' ministry uh, and Pastor Ella. We have an incredible, incredible uh, kids' pastor. She does an amazing job. I mean, she is such a blessing to so many in the church, right? Absolutely. Give a round of applause. And so we just want to share a little bit about that, and then I've got a quick announcement on Kids' Explosion. Good morning, Access Church. My name is Ella Kerstetter, and I'm a children's pastor. And I have the privilege of overseeing the children from kindergarten to fifth grade at Access Church. It is our mission to see them grow in their knowledge and relationship of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Psalms 1, 1 through 4, it states, A man who obeys the laws of the Lord is like a tree that's planted by streams of living water where their leaves do not wither. It is our prayer that our children would prosper in all they do. And this last year, I had the privilege of seeing 17 children rededicate their lives to the Lord. And I'm looking forward to more testimonies like this as we head into our summer schedule. Next week, we uh, start out with Kids Explosion, a kids summer camp for, kind for those entering kindergarten through fifth grade. It's three nights filled with Bible lessons, crafts, games, great fellowship. You can register your children on the Access uh, website. And then we have, throughout the month, we have um, Kids Life Group that meets on the second and the fourth Friday of every month. And uh, we have a short devotion and they have the opportunity to build relationship with one another. It's just a fun time. And thank you for entrusting your children to the ministry. And we'd love for you to get involved in the children's ministry here at Access Church. If you could do me a favor, when you see her, please thank her. Again, she is amazing, amazing, amazing. She does an amazing job. Uh, she doesn't just show up. I mean, she really, really invests in the kids in terms of prayer time. I mean, she's always taking kids out to lunch and doing things. I mean, she's an incredible, incredible pastor. So please, when you see her, uh, make sure to, to thank her today. As she mentioned, we do have Kids Explosion, which is coming up this week. It's going to be awesome, awesome, awesome. We would ask, can you please be praying? Uh, it's going to be Wednesday night, Thursday night, and Friday night from 6 to 8 o'clock. You can be praying for good weather. You can be praying for all those that have volunteered in their time, uh, just that everything goes smoothly. Uh, we're believing and knowing that it will, uh, but it's going to be an awesome, awesome time for the kids. If you have not registered your kids, you can still do that. Please go to the website and register your kids. We're going to go ahead and receive the offering at this point. Up on the screen, you'll see a couple ways that you can give. You can give in person, via the boxes in the back. You can give online or via text message. God, we ask that you would bless the offering in every way. Lord God, we thank you for uh, what you're doing and the opportunity to invest uh, in your kingdom. God, we ask that you would multiply it and bless it in every way, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. And uh, Lord willing... We'll have a party tonight, and uh, you know, I just, it's hard to cancel stuff right now because it seems like the world has been canceled the last year and a half, and so we'll just wait to the last minute, and uh, some of you have said, you know, I really want to be able to connect with people, and so the pool parties and things like that that we do are great ways to get to know uh, one another, so if you don't want to swim, just come hang out. There's plenty of stuff to do outside, and uh, we'll have a good time together. I want to just kind of put this out there so you can be planning. We're planning on July 4th to have, I know we did uh, several months back, we had like a praise day on a Sunday morning. We're going to be doing that July 4th, and then we're going to have a huge picnic here. And I know many of us have been waiting till uh, it was legal to have picnics, uh, but July 4th, we're going to have one. And so we'll have a big tent upside, uh, upside, uh, upside down. We'll have a big tent outside, and it's just going to be a great day. So that'll be July 4th, and then uh, you can just stay. We'll have stuff for the kids and things like that, and then go watch the fireworks for wherever you want to watch them. So we're not going to uh, have fireworks here. Um, but, hey, that would be fun, right? 
Hey, I want to just ask you to pray this week uh, for Kelsey Shop. Uh, Kelsey and her Nath- uh, husband, Nathan, uh, she founded a missions organization several years ago, and uh, she just landed in uh, El Salvador uh, with a team, and uh, she'll share at some point, Lord willing, she has another trip coming up, and I told her that we would be praying as her church, we'd be praying for her, uh, but she, she posted this on Friday, and it just really encouraged me. Here's what she said, never in my childhood did I envision Uh, This is such a huge part of my life, but God's plan is always better than what we envision for ourselves. I never thought God could use me, a small-town girl, for international missions, but he did. And uh, she founded a missions organization. Now she's on the ground with a team ministering in orphanages and things like that this, this week. So let's just even just right now pray for her. Father, we pray for Kelsey today. Lord, as she's leading this trip, Father, we pray that you would guide, that you would direct every step, Lord, that they take. Lord, you know and you have plans for them this week. And Father, I pray that just every detail that the ministry to the orphans uh, that they're they're working with there, Father, I pray just every detail will fall into perfect alignment. Pray for powerful testimonies. Thank you, Jesus. In your name, amen. So be praying uh, this week for Kelsey. And uh, you can pull out your Bible and turn to John chapter 20. Next week's Father's Day. And uh, we'll pause uh, the series on the Holy Spirit just for one week, have something to share for uh, all of you men. We'll have a good time, okay? Lots of laughs. I won't beat you over the head on Father's Day. Nobody comes to church uh, on, a, on a Sunday like Father's Day and expects a sucker punch. So I have something uh, that's on my heart that'll just be fun. We'll have a good time next Sunday. And I uh, hope you have a good time every Sunday, you know? Uh, so... We're in a series on the subject of the Holy Spirit, and if you weren't here last week, we talked about the Holy Spirit being our very best friend. Last week, I said the Holy Spirit will do for us everything that Jesus did for the disciples and more. He's not an it, right? He's not an it, but the Holy Spirit is is a person. And uh, we concluded, and I said, you might try... To see without eyes, hear without ears, or breathe without lungs as to try to live the life that God intended us to live without the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit should be everything to us. What I want to do this morning is I want to talk to you about the Holy Spirit because a lot of times we have this misconception that we believe that the Holy Spirit like showed up on the scene in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. But my heart today is for you to see from the very beginning of Scripture that the Holy Spirit was present, and we'll talk about the breath of God. That the Holy Spirit was present not only in creation, that the Holy Spirit was not only present when the authors uh, penned the words that we read in Scripture, but he's also with Jesus each and every step of the way. How much more should we depend and trust and rely on our relationship with the Holy Spirit? In John chapter 20, it, it, it records the after the resurrection, according to John, right? Jesus had risen from the dead, and the disciples, they're, they're hiding. They're kind of behind locked doors. They're in hiding. They're not believing that the resurrection has taken place, even though you know Mary Magdalene and several other women have, had seen and told them about the resurrection. They're not fully convinced. It's interesting that these guys that walked with Jesus all these years, he even prepared them, and yet here he has died, he has uh, rose from the dead, and now they're hiding behind locked doors Sunday night, Easter, 2,000 plus years ago. The Bible says in John chapter 20, on that evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. So this is the first Sunday, right? Easter night. They're, they're not fully convinced that Jesus has rose from the dead. And Jesus comes to them. He finds them. And he's going to speak to the trouble that they're experiencing in their hearts. Verse 20, he, the Bible says it's, that he shows him his hands. He shows him his side, right? And at that moment, they're convinced without any doubt that, that Jesus is alive, that he is who he is said he is, and he's real, and he's standing there. He appeared to them. Now, he says this. He says, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending what? You. 
These are very profound and very intimidating words. Can you imagine the weight of responsibility that these words carry? The resurrected Christ appears to you. He says, my peace be with you. Just as the Father sent me, now I'm sending you. I'm sending you, and, and you're going to represent me with your lives, with your words. You're going to take the gospel with you, the same things that I did. Now the Father is sending you. Now, if I was hearing this, I, I would be honest with you, I would feel completely inadequate. I would feel kind of hopeless, like, seriously? You're leaving me. You're putting me in charge, right? These aren't a, a group of professionals. Jesus says, as the Father sent me, I'm sending you. And now he says in verse 20, says that he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Now, in the Gospel of John, this is the most difficult verse in the entire Gospel to interpret precisely. And there are a lot of great interpretations on this verse, and I'm not going to get into those today. You can ask Pastor Jonathan Schrock. He's a scholar in that kind of stuff. But there are a lot of, you know, we're, we, we want to try to figure everything out, right, in our mind. Now, there's a lot of interpretations on exactly what happened in this moment. But I can safely conclude that we know that there's an element of it being symbolic. We know that there's an element of it being connected to spiritual preparation. Jesus breathed on them to symbolize or to prepare them and remind them that the breath of God would come over them, the breath of God would come in them. And in this moment, I believe he's reassuring them that they're not gonna have to rely on their own effort. They're not gonna have to rely on their own ability. They're not gonna have to rely on their own ingenuity to carry out the task that Jesus had given them to represent him in the world. And so he reassures them and he breathes on them. Now we know that later on he tells them to go to Jerusalem and wait for the gift that the Father promised. They said, you know, don't go start a church, don't go win souls, don't go witness, don't preach a sermon, just go and wait for the gift that the Father promised. And in Acts chapter 2, they're one accord, and in the upper room, they're praying. They're seeking the Lord, and then suddenly there came from heaven a sound like the mighty rushing wind. It was like the breath of God breathed on them once again. We'll talk about that later this summer. But I want to share with you for a bit about this idea of the breath of God, that the Holy Spirit existed from the very beginning of page number one in your Bible. So turn to Genesis chapter one, and we'll talk about the Holy Spirit and his work in creation. His work in creation. If you turn to Genesis one, verse two, you'll see it on the screen. You can also follow these notes in the, in the program online as well. Here's what it says in verse two. It says, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and what? The spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The Holy Spirit didn't show up on the scene in Acts chapter 2 like he you know, wasn't around before then. The Bible says all the way back in, in verse 2 or page 1 of the Bible that the Holy Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, hovering over the waters. The breath of God, the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now, the image here that's used is like a chicken hovering over its little chicks or a bird covering the babies in the nest. In Genesis 1, it says that God says, right? It says his spirit is hovering, but then it says that God speaks or God says light. And what happens? Light. By the very spoken word of God or by the very breath of God, by our breath, words take form, right? Try to say a word without breath. So when I say speaking, it was by the very breath of God that he created all the way from the very beginning of time. Write this down. Nothing is the raw material that God used to create everything. Nothing but what? Nothing but his breath. Nothing is the raw material that God used to create everything. Nothing but his breath spoken word. 
his breath. And when you speak your words, the breath, those words take form. Now in Psalm 33, verse 6, it says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, the starry hosts by the breath of his mouth. How powerful is God? That by the word, the heavens were made, and the starry host by the breath of his mouth. Now think about stars for a minute. 150 years before Jesus was born, there was a Greek philosopher that estimated that there were 1,022 stars. How did he come up with that? I have no clue. Do I really care? No. Is it true? Sure. Right? 200 years after Jesus, someone else came on the scene, said there were 1,026 stars, so four more. (laughs) Years later, with the invention of the telescope, all of a sudden we see that there are millions of stars. During 1921, there was an American astronomer that says the stars are innumerable. We go a little bit farther into the depths of space, and we know that there are galaxies of stars that cannot be seen with even the most powerful telescope. And think about the breath of God that every one of those stars came by what? The breath of his mouth. Not only did he breathe them into existence, but he had the ability to name those. Who is this God that in his breath creates innumerable stars in the skies, labels those with names. What gets better than that? Well, let's go back to Genesis. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground. I want you to see the Holy Spirit in creation because this is awesome. That God took like the dust from the ground and this is our physical nature. Go ahead and pinch yourself, right? You got a, you got a physical, pinch the person next to you. Get away, come on. <laughs> This is our physical nature. Where did that come from? The dust of the ground. The physical matter, the idea that he formed, the image is like a potter molding and shaping a piece of beautiful artwork on the potter's wheel. It's amazing how complex our bodies are. The physical part of our bodies, it's an amazingly complex organism and the wisdom of God to design and the power to create from the dust of the ground something out of nothing, right? So he creates from the dust of the ground this physical shell of a being. That's our physical nature. But now what's more powerful than that? Well, it goes on and it says that he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. What did this look like? This must have been pretty crazy to see. (laughs) Haven't seen this picture on the wall of the church, right? Could you imagine you have flowy hair Jesus holding a sheep, right? And then you've got crazy God blowing into the whatever dust being and all of a sudden, haven't seen that photo before. Valerie, that's your next assignment. So he breathed. Man wasn't just physical, but now man has a spiritual nature. God is spirit, right? He doesn't have lungs for being, but the idea here is that he breathed in this spiritual nature, and then it goes on, and it says what? It talks about man became a living being. Man became a living being, like the psychology, the the nature of, of, of the reality that we have a soul. Unlike angels, unlike animals, human beings now have this special, unique ability to relate to God. We have a personality, we have a mind, we have emotions that feel, we, we have wills that make decisions. We have the ability to know God and to be loved by him, right? To know God. So just with his breath, he formed the dust, right? He breathed into the nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living being. Now when you... Flip to the gospel of John chapter 3. You don't have to go there. You, you need to see not only the physical being, not only the 
spiritual side of us and the psychological or the soul part, but the spiritual existence as well. In John chapter 3, Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, unless a man be born again, he cannot see what? The kingdom of God. Nicodemus is asking about salvation, and, and here's what Jesus says. He says, flesh gives birth to flesh, spirit gives birth to spirit. Now, I get flesh gives birth to flesh, right? We understand that with our minds, but this whole idea of spirit gives birth to spirit is amazing, right? Because you can't see it, but you see its effects, right? Think of tornadoes. Do you see the wind? No. What do you see? The effects of the wind. As Nicodemus is inquiring about this spiritual birth, he says, flesh gives birth to flesh, spirit gives birth to spirit. It's, it's not something that you can see, the breath of God, the spirit of God, but we certainly see its effects. It's the Holy Spirit, not our effort, that makes us children of God. That the Holy Spirit now recreates us, right? We're born again. This spiritual existence, you can't see when it happens with the physical eyes, but you certainly see the effects or the results of it. It's the addict that all of a sudden becomes clean. It's the alcoholic that now is sober. It's the angry person that now is exhibiting peace and gentleness. It's the sinner identified as, as a saint. It's the effects of that which we see, the Spirit of God recreating us. He is present at the work of creation from the very beginning of time to this present moment that he is continuing all across the face of the earth. As people come into relationship with God, the breath of God, breathing in that conviction. Have you ever, you know what that's like, right? You remember when the first time you came to Christ, you were sitting in church, you're sitting at home reading a Bible, somebody was sharing your faith and it was like the breath of God. The wind of God was convicting your heart, right? You surrendered your life to Christ and the Holy Spirit begins to transform you. It's his creative work from the very beginning of the pages of scripture. It's his work in creation. Now, many of you, you're holding a Bible, right? Some of you, your Bibles are glowing. Others of you, you flipped them open with keypads today, right? I want you to see how present the Holy Spirit is even in the work of the word, the revelation that we have from the word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is what? God breathed. And is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. All scripture, every word, every page, every chapter, every book is breathed of God. That's powerful to think about. The work of the Holy Spirit, not just in creation, but the work of the Spirit in the Word. The Bible is not just a collection of stories. It's not a collection of myths or human ideas about God. The Bible is God-breathed. It's not a human book. So the Holy Spirit moved on people's lives, right? And, they re and he revealed his personhood. He revealed his plan to those that were authoring scripture. I want to explain this to you a little bit. It may sound a little heady this morning, and, and that's okay. Because you have to understand why we believe what we believe. Why is the Bible different than every other book? Well, the Bible says that God breathed the word. He didn't breathe on the word, but he actually breathed the word. So he spoke in creation into existence, right? But now he speaks, and we have the inspiration of Scripture. Here's what it says in 2 Peter, and it's focusing on prophecy. It says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy in Scripture came about by a prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the... But the prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Spirit. This phrase, carried along by the Spirit, is, is a nautical word. And it's the idea of the winds carrying a sail in, into, the, into the ocean, right? When I was in college in uh, Barrington, Rhode Island, there was a place that we could go. It was just like, it was beautiful. People would travel from all over to go uh, along the water. And you could, you could look out into the ocean, 
and you could see sailboats and you'd see fishermen, just all kinds of really cool things. But it's a place you could go and you could just kind of sit there for a couple hours and you would see amazing things. But one of the fascinating things I would remember is we would go, some of us, we'd study there and so forth. I remember being there and you would see these small sailboats that were out on the water. And when the wind would rush along the edge, you could see the wind kind of catch the sails and redirect the ships. The idea here is the Bible's talking about the wind of God, that the word of God isn't just this idea that prophets spoke something that came to their mind and it was their own idea. It was that the wind of God took the word of God and he spoke to these men. It wasn't just their talents and their education and cultural backgrounds. He certainly tied those things in, but it was like the spirit of God like the wind in a sail guided the writings in such a way that it authored exactly what you and I need to receive. They faithfully committed to communicate the word that we spoke. So the Bible, or that is, that is written. So the Bible in and of itself, when you really study it, is a miracle. How it all came together without contradiction. The spirit of God, the breath of God carried these authors along to the destination as they wrote the word. Now, Acts chapter 1, verse 16, another portion of scripture, it says, brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago. The idea is that the scripture was spoken by God. The Holy Spirit spoke. Here's what it says in John 14. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I have said to you. Now, think about this for a minute because we always typically preach this verse and we talk about that the Holy Spirit will take the word, right? And he'll remind us, he'll apply it, he'll take and he's the divine teacher that will remind us of everything that God has spoken to us. But I want you to think about it for a minute. How did Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John remember everything that they wrote down? Not pastors, they're not professional teachers, they're not theologians, they're common, everyday people. Common, everyday people. And they're men. <laughs> now, you might have good memory, but I don't. In fact, I remember going into Walmart several years ago, and Ashley sent me to a store to pick up two things. I left my phone in the car, and so I start, maybe you've been there before, you forget what you're there for. You had one assignment to get two things, and you walk into Walmart. You don't know what you're there for. And so what do you do? Instead of go walk to get the phone, you just kind of like aimlessly walk around, you know, aisle to aisle, section to section, like you're a mental patient or a shoplifter is kind of like what I... (laughs) And I remember one of the employees coming over to me, and they said, can I help you? That was their way of trying to figure out, like, what is he doing? I said, sure, you can help me. And they said, what are you trying to find? I'm like, that's the problem. <laughs> that's the problem. Just give me two things and take a guess. It's the right thing. I, I just, how did these guys remember everything that they wrote? But by the Holy Spirit. Right? But by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit brought these things to remembrance to them. And it'll bring them to our remembrance as well. As well. Now, John says in, in his gospel, he says, if we wrote everything that Jesus did, all the books in the world couldn't contain the volumes, right? But the Spirit of God, the breath of God, the wind of God, the carrying away, brought to remembrance exactly what they needed to write, using their personality, using their background, using all of, you know, Luke was a doctor. Did you know that? So you read his writings, it's very different than Matthew. It's very different than John. So he kind of incorporated all of those things, but it led, was the whole process was led by the Holy Spirit. He didn't just show up on the scene in Acts chapter 2. He was at creation. He was with these authors, right, bringing back to remembrance the word as as they took time and they wrote it. But I want you to see Finally, his work in the incarnation, the Holy Spirit is active in every point of Jesus' life. 
And if the Holy Spirit's active in every point of Jesus' life, how much more important is it that we acknowledge, like we talked about, the personhood of the Holy Spirit in our lives? Now, we see, first of all, the Holy Spirit at the conception in the womb. Look at what it says in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. The Virgin Mary, right? It says, what's conceived in her is from what? The Holy Spirit. Wow. What's conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Now, Luke is a little different. He's a doctor, so he writes from more of a medical perspective, right? And here's what Luke writes. He says, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The idea is almost like, the spirit that's hovering over the waters. It's like the, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. The Holy One will be born, will be called the Son of God. Now, when Jesus was born, he already had a divine nature. He already existed in the past before the foundation of the world, just like the Holy Spirit. But when Jesus was born, Humanly speaking, in the womb, when he was conceived in the womb, he was given a a human nature. The Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. He enveloped Mary, right? And the Holy Spirit of God was like the father of Jesus. He had no other human father, right? No human sperm, no human seed, but the egg of a mother was fertilized miraculously by what? The Holy Spirit. Even at Jesus' conception, we see the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, if we fast forward a little bit later, when Jesus is baptized, what a powerful moment. In his baptism, he comes to the Jordan River to be baptized by John the Baptist, and the Holy Spirit's active there. It says that the Holy Spirit came down from heaven when Jesus came up out of the water and rested and remained on him in the form of what? A dove. A dove. What a powerful illustration. What a reminder of the sensitivity and the gentleness of a dove. Oh, what it would be like to be a person that walks with that level of sensitivity. Every move, every decision, Every word that's spoken with the simple reminder of the dove that's rested upon us. He was at at work in the conception. Jesus is baptized. The the heavens open. The Holy Spirit, boom, and descends on him as a form in the form of a dove. We see even the Holy Spirit in the temptation of Jesus. Jesus led into the wilderness by what? the Holy Spirit at conception, at his baptism, led into the wilderness by the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was there when Jesus came forth victoriously out of that moment of temptation, that space there. When he says, nothing that I do, I do on my own. Can you imagine Jesus saying that? Coming out of the wilderness, he's like, nothing I do, I do on my own. I do all of these things by the power of what? The Spirit. He's at work all through the life of Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 9, verses 23 through 26, the Holy Spirit, it was like he carried the blood of Jesus into the tabernacle, the temple of God in heaven. The Holy Spirit brought this precious blood of Jesus and he sprinkled the blood on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant to show that sin had been atoned for once and for all. The Holy Spirit paved and provided a way for you and I to experience the presence of God. The Holy Spirit was even with Jesus at his resurrection. He's dead in the tomb. His enemies think, oh, we've got him. The demons in hell are probably laughing, making a joke of it. Oh, we got him. The tomb is sealed shut by the authority of the Roman government that if anybody breaks the seal, you're executed. Jesus is in the tomb. But even the seal of the Roman government, but the tomb of Jesus couldn't stop the breath of God. 
What does the Bible say? In Romans 8, 11, he was raised from the dead by what? The Spirit of God. Wow. That Spirit that spoke in creation, that breathed life into man, we became a living being. That Spirit that, like wind in a sails, perfectly guided those that wrote and penned the words of Scripture. That same spirit is at work in every point of Jesus' life, every place. The same spirit. What gets even more amazing than this as the worship team comes back? Romans 8, 11. That if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in what? You. Say me too. Man. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. That's amazing. When you you can get it, and by God's grace, you've got to get it from here down into here. That the spirit that hovered at creation spoke. The spirit that guided and directed the authors of scripture. The spirit that was at Jesus at conception had his baptism in the wilderness, empowering him to... Where is that spirit in our world today? Not in the four walls of a church building. Not in a temple in the Middle East. Not in the lives of a few select prophets or pastors or teachers. That same spirit lives within me. That same spirit lives within you. If you can get this truth from here into here, it changes everything. It changes everything. Because that same spirit does what? Takes the word that was given by common men, but it was actually intended for us as common people to receive it, right? That's why you don't need some person with a PhD in biblical studies to read the Bible. You can just take this book between you and the Lord tomorrow and before work say, God, would you speak to me? This is your word. Would your Holy Spirit take something that's in here Connect it right here. Have you ever just been doing devotions and like you're, you're reading and it's like, man, there's like a lot of pages in here. This is my wife's Bible that's falling apart. Somebody once said, when you find a Bible that's falling apart, it's in the hands of somebody whose life isn't. There's a lot of truth there, right? Some of you didn't get that. If you find a Bible that's falling apart, it's in the hands of somebody whose life isn't, right? Because they take it, they apply it. 2,258 pages. And the Holy Spirit, on a Monday morning, you take this word and you say, Lord, I'm going to just read from Ezekiel today. You say, God, would you speak to me today? The breath of God. And all of a sudden, you read it, you say, God, would you speak to me today? Maybe it doesn't resonate in that moment, but how many of you, two hours, three hours, four hours later, all of a sudden something happens and you're like, oh, that's what I was reading earlier. That's what it means. Or all of a sudden you're going to make a decision at work. And in the moment of decision, there's a scripture that just comes to mind. And it's something you read the week before. Or maybe it's you going home like people say all the time. Man, what you talked about this morning was exactly what I was thinking the other day. Right? What is that? It's the Spirit of God. He takes the Word. He attaches. He applies it. He connects it with our lives. Right? So when you understand this reality, the Spirit of God lives within you. It shapes how you read the Word. It shapes how you see yourself. 
oh man, if I could just try harder to be like Jesus. Huh? You ever try harder to be, you ever try harder? Oh, I just wish I could fix my, I wish I could break that addiction. I wish I could. When you acknowledge that the spirit of God, the very breath that named every star in heaven, that spirit lives within you and you can't break a nicotine addiction. You can't break a pornography addiction. You can't get rid of anger. It's not in working harder. It's in saying, God, your spirit lives within me. And I can do all things through what? Christ, who gives me strength. You have to see yourself as someone that's thoroughly equipped by the Holy Spirit, the breath of God that's at work in your life. Now, the word that's used here, the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead is living. And he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body. The word here is like this idea of quickening. What's quickening? I was just looking it up during worship. I was singing and Googling at the same time. Sorry, but I'm sure you've done it too. To make or become faster or quicker. To stimulate. For something to be stimulated. Here's how I want to close today. As I was just praying during worship. Just felt like the Holy Spirit was just speaking to me and saying. There are specific things that are going on in your life. In your relationship with Christ. And this whole idea of quickening is something that the Lord wants to do today. I don't know what the situation is. I don't know what the circumstance is. But as you say, I'm not going to try harder to fix this thing, but I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to quicken. If he can quicken and give life to our mortal bodies, right? He can quicken. He can fix situations and things that we walk through. So I want you to stand with me today. And if that's you and that just resonates with something specific and you're like, Holy Spirit, whatever this situation is, I'm trusting that God, you can do before the end of this service what would take me three or four years to figure out and fix on my own. If you know what that is, would you just raise your hand to heaven? And we're going to pray in a minute. Just lift it up to the Lord. Just say, thank you, Lord. Thank him in advance. Thank you, Lord, that the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead not only quickens our mortal bodies, but there's a quickening of circumstances. There's a quickening of situations that are represented by every hand that's lifted. And so right now, Lord, we just thank you in advance for these situations. Lord, we're not trying harder. We're not going to try to do it in our own strength. But we're acknowledging that we need the helper. We need the Holy Spirit, the one that comes alongside of us, pulls a chair alongside of us, puts his arm around us, and he quickens and he fixes and he does for us what we can't do for ourselves. Every one of those situations, we just thank you, Jesus, that you're at work in our lives you are an amazing God that you chose to dwell within us that we carry your presence with us everywhere that we go we're never alone because you're with us Father I thank you that the breath of God refreshes us I thank you that the breath of God breathes peace The breath of God is filled with joy. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. We're going to just go back into a slower worship song. I'm going to invite some of our leaders to come forward. And if you would like prayer this morning, we want the opportunity to pray for you. I believe that the Lord can seal whatever that thing was that you acknowledged by just raising your hand. But there's also time to just come and say, Lord, I'm presenting it at the altar. Our leaders, we want to pray for you. We believe that God will minister to you today. And I just want to remind you when we pray, you don't need to have like stage four terminal cancer to receive prayer at the altar. The Bible says that the Lord delights in every detail of our lives. There is nothing that's too insignificant to just say, Lord, I'm placing this into your care today. So as we worship, I want to invite you to just come forward. We'd love the opportunity to pray for you. 
Or maybe if you don't come to one of the leaders, you just come and stand across the front. That's just your way of saying, Lord, I surrender this particular thing to you. I thank you for the quickening work of your spirit that's going to do something in this moment. Let's just respond to the Lord this morning. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Lord. Holy Spirit, come we meet you, Lord. Death could not hold you. Veil told me for you. Silence above just secret. The heavens are holy. Praise of you. we thank you for forgiveness. We thank you for your grace. Lord, we thank you for healing. 
We thank you for provision. We thank you for all of the fruit of the Spirit, Lord, that you develop in our lives. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that you've given us. You've thoroughly equipped us for everything that we need. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, I would encourage you before you leave to come forward. We'd like the opportunity to pray for you. If you're watching online, you're watching from prison, you're one decision away from experiencing the peace of God in your life, knowing that your sins are forgiven, the heavens your home. We'd love the opportunity to pray for you as well. You can just put a comment in the section. We'll reach out to you. Father, I pray for every person that's here today. Father, bless them. In every area of their lives, Father, as they spend time in the word this week, Holy Spirit, I pray you would speak to them. Lord, I pray you would guide and you would direct their steps. Jesus, I pray you would equip us for the works, God, that you've called us to, to represent you in our community with our lives and our words. I pray you give us the opportunity to pray for the sick. Thank you, Jesus, that you left and you sent your helper to us, the Holy Spirit. We never take that for granted. Lord, I pray there would be a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit all throughout our day, all throughout our week. We be reminded of the gentleness of the dove that rested upon Jesus, that there would be that level of sensitivity, the person of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. We'll worship a little bit more if you want to stay and pray and worship. If not, God bless. Have a wonderful day. Bring your dad next Sunday, and uh, we'll have a good time together.